I will turn on this. Can you hear me? Is this mic working? Good. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here today, and, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to be speaking with Sterling. I think our presentations are complementary here because he's working on a disruptive technology, and, and, uh, and, and one of the things that, uh, that I would suggest is that when you're listening to him, think about uh, what I present today. I'm going to talk a little bit about elements of value, and you can think about the elements of value that come with, uh, with self-driving vehicles. Um, one, of the, one of the issues, and I'd just like to set up the problem here, that, uh, that we face in the world is that there is a lot of technological change. And, uh, and those technolo technological change, cre changes create disruption. They, uh, they change industries. People lose their jobs. Money's won and money's lost in the process. For example, let's see if this is going to work here. Uh, there's questions like, will gene modification change the fundamental productivity of agriculture? What does that do to farming? Will retail stores disappear as e-commerce expands? And actually, a lot of retail stores have gone bankrupt in the, in the past year or two. Will renewables or electric vehicles cause the oil and gas industry to c collapse? And when is that going to happen? Will robots displace most service workers? Or are we all going to be, are we going to all get rid of our cars and just be riding around in uh, uh, robo-taxis uh, that we call with an app. These are, these are big questions and how they're going to take place and knowing, knowing when they're going to take place um, can make a, you know, a huge impact. The number of, uh, of taxi drivers that could lose their jobs, the, the number of stranded assets, the billions of dollars that could be lost, if you don't know the answers to these questions, is actually quite, quite phenomenal. The other thing that's happening is that the pace of change is increasing dramatically. You've maybe seen some charts that show how fast technology with S-curves. What this does is it just takes those S-curves and says, how long did it take from the time the technology started getting onto the steep slope of the S-curve until it achieved 80% of the maximum, so to when it starts getting to the, the flatter slope. And you can see that the stove took 53 years. The cell phone took seven. And so the pace of adoption has, has increased dramatically. And so understanding that is also critical. The other thing is that generally the markets see this before consumers do. So for example, Blockbuster saw their valuation drop by 85% from 2002 to 2006, in spite of the fact that during that period their revenues were actually flat. So they actually weren't losing business over that period of time, but their, their stock price went down. If you, were, if you were a shareholder and you hung on from here, it's a pretty disapp disappointing investment for you. Same thing, BlackBerry. Actually, their stock price lost 90% of its value while their revenues tripled. So quarter after quarter, they were showing tremendous growth, and their stock price was languishing. So wouldn't you like to know that, sort of right here? so that you can sell before it loses 90% of its value? That's really the question that I want to address today, is how can you think about that? Forecasting is always a difficult art, particularly the future, but, but the question is, can you see it a few months or a few years ahead of everybody else? Lots of people are out there trying to make forecasts, and this is just looking at electric vehicle forecasts that have been made over the last couple of years. And these are all companies who have made projections of how much penetration they think there will be in 2025 of electric vehicles. And you can see that the projections are from a low of about 6% to a high of about 35%, and e literally everything in between. And what you mostly know about this is that none of them are going to be right at this point. None of those projections are actually going to be right. And analysts are out there trying to predict what's going to happen in the market. Again, here's a bunch of analysts' projections. This is from 2010 through 2017 of what people thought that battery costs would be in 2020. So in 2017, here's what the OEMs announced that they were buying batteries for. And so all of these people missed the number by more than three years. You know, it's just, it's just amazing. This technology has been coming down faster than anybody could actually predict. Here's another industry that's, uh, that's quite volatile, the oil and gas industry that I've spent quite a bit of time in. And it's had some big price shocks over time. 
In between July and December of 2008, oil prices dropped about 75 percent. Gas prices between July of 2008 and 2009 dropped about 85 percent. There's recovery, but in between May and March uh, of 11 and 12, Gas prices dropped again about 60 percent. They recovered somewhat. And then in uh, 2014, of course, all of you remember when, when oil prices dropped. Um, they dropped about half between June 14 and February 15. They actually dropped more after that. The ultimate bottom of that was about a 72 percent drop. And from uh, September 14 to October 15, gas prices dropped again by about 50 percent. So really, you know, could anyone have predicted those? And how would you predict them? One place that people often look to is futures markets, because the perspective on futures markets is there's a lot of smart money thinking about it. And that, that estimate is the best estimate that the market has, because half the people are betting above, and half the people are betting below, and they're using all the available information in the market. But the futures market didn't see the 2014 price drop. That futures market just held steady, steady eddy the, the entire time. These are four months, six months, and 12 month futures just said that prices were going to continue, and then prices dropped anyway. Same thing with natural gas. Even though you see a little bit more volatility there, which is driven primarily by seasonality in natural gas markets because of how we use natural gas for heating in the winters and so on, but still, they were project the, the markets were actually projecting that natural gas prices would go up, and instead they took a nosedive. So why didn't they predict it, and is it possible to predict these things? Well, it actually turns out that at Bain & Company, we had predicted that. We had done a lot of work, and one of the things that we had been looking at is the cost of fracking. So as you can see here in 2004, it cost about $25 to get an MCF of gas out of the ground. But those costs were coming down, and they were coming down what we call an experience curve. And an experience curve is based on the idea that as cumulative production increases, the costs come down at a fairly predictable rate. And in fact, we've done a lot of research. When I wrote my book, we, we did research on 79 industries. And what we found in those 79 industries that adjusted for inflation, that on average, for every doubling of cumulative experience, prices dropped or costs dropped. Actually, there's a lot of reasons why they tend to drop together, but they drop by about anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. About 90 percent of those 79 um, industries were in that band of Every time production doubles, the costs drop 20 to 30 percent. Normal distribution in there in the midpoint was about uh, 25 percent. So a 72 percent experience curve, which means for every doubling of production, costs drop by 28 percent. That's what we were seeing. And you can see actually a very nice, a very nice correlation there in terms of what was happening. And in 2007, for the first time, we saw that nat the, the cost of getting natural gas out of the ground was below the market price. Well, this, this cost will give about a 15 percent IRR if you're selling the natural gas. And so what's going to happen when that happens? When it's suddenly attractive to invest in it, you're going to see an explosion in, uh, in that happening. And as that number of wells drilled continues to grow, you would expect that the costs would continue to come down. So that was in 2007 that you could see that. But when did the market begin to see it? Well, this is the, on the right, what you have is just a view of how many internet searches there were on the topic of fracking. And basically, the signposts showed that it was viable in 2007, as we see here. The market didn't really start noticing it until 2010. And that's when the explosion and all the, all the thoughts about fracking and everything else sort of came to the fore. But if you were watching this, you could see it. You could see it. And that's really the power of the experience curve. We did a similar thing with, uh, with, with tight oil, because tight oil is a completely separate thing. But as we saw the costs coming down for fracking, we, we suggested that North American tight oil was going to become a major producer in the market, and that the costs would be down around closer to $50 a barrel. 
market price in 2012 was about $80. And basically what we said is as this stuff comes on, it is going to change the pricing in the market. And in fact, by 2014, we were continuing to say the same thing, and I was running around the country, and I wrote an article in Oil and Gas Journal and so on and so forth saying, the sky is falling, we're going to have oversupply, prices are going to drop, and when we've seen prices drop in the past, they've dropped anywhere from 30 to 70 percent, and we're going to see that happen again. And then, of course, in September of 2014, it happened. Not many people listened to me, to be honest with you, but it happened. And we were, it, we were watching what was happening in the marketplace and how much supply was coming on. And we knew that when supply exceeded demand, we we're going to see a change in the, in the clearing prices. So the question is, we saw that. And I'm going to give you an example in a little bit of how some of our clients took advantage of that and, uh, and really increased their market value. But the question is, those are commodities. Can the approach be, be uh, replicated? And can you do it in, in other industries as well? So let me just share with you a few of the concepts here. What you really have to answer here as you're thinking about new technologies is, will demand take off for this technology? In other words, does it create enough value for the customers or the consumers for it to take off? When will that take place? The second is, how much of the market do, does it address? How, much, how big will that market become? And what's the maximum adoption potential? And then the third question is, how fast will it happen? What's the, what's the slope of that S-curve, if you will? And the real key then here to this is to start identifying the things that will tell you one way or another. So for example, watching the costs with an experience curve can be a signpost. There could be regulatory signposts. There could be new technology signposts, et cetera. And I'll talk a little bit about those. We think about using three well-known but oftentimes misused tools that can actually dramatically increase your ability to identify the size, the timing, and the pace of these disruptions. The first one's the experience curve, which I've already talked to you about, which basically we plot this on a log-log scale. And when you plot it on a log-log scale, the relationship of every doubling reducing the cost by x percent becomes a line. And you can begin to trace that out. The second is the S-curve. Once it reaches a tipping point, in other words, when the product gets to a point where it has a low enough cost or a high enough value relative to the substitutes in the market, it can then begin to substitute and it will grow. And it will grow at certain, uh, certain rates. But what will determine that will be the barriers to substitution. So what might keep it from being uh, uh, adopted in the marketplace and what might accelerate its adoption. Now here's an interesting example. Here's one of the things that I've been looking at now for a number of years is the question of when will lithium ion batteries be low enough in cost that electric vehicles will make, uh, will make sense? And, uh, and the answer is it's pr probably sometime in the next two to five years. Basically what we've done, this, this experience curve is one that we've actually been tracking since about 2008. And, uh, and, and, and actually, I've got some presentations from 2008 that make a projection out. And it's actually been remarkably accurate over time. In, in fact, within a couple of dollars, we projected in 2008 what the costs are for batteries today. We didn't know anything about what all the technological changes would be. We just knew that there was an experience curve, and we could project that. Now, going forward, uh, you'll see that I've got two scenarios here. And we do things in a little bit of scenarios. This slope right here, I mentioned to you that of the 79 industries that we've looked at, that the midpoint of that, uh, of that group is about a 75% slope. So a very 56% a slope is actually a very steep slope. And there's an argument that that won't continue. And so if it goes back to a more traditional slope that most industries are on, It'll take us until about 2023 to hit what is this, you know, sort of considered the magic tipping point on batteries. This is the point. It's a little bit more complex than this. But this is, in general, the point at which people feel like you could sell an electric car and an internal combustion engine car for the same price that, ha that was comparably equipped. So that's, that's the point that everybody's looking for. And when is that going to happen? It could happen, you know, Elon Musk keeps telling people that he'll get there by 2020, and maybe he will. 
if he follows the same experience curve that's been followed, he might get there. If it slows down a little bit, it could take a few more years to actually get to that point. But we're on the cusp of, of getting to that purchase price parity tipping point. The reason that, that analysts are not getting there and why they're always behind on things like lithium ion batteries is because they're not, first of all, they're not using the experience curve and they're not taking into account the fact that as capacity and production begins to ramp up exponentially, the experience is, is, uh, is ramping up exponentially and therefore you can accelerate those cost reductions. They're basically looking at it and say, okay, costs came down 15% a year the last three years, that's what will happen the next three years. They also are taking very much an average view and oftentimes they are trying to, what seems like great analysis, they do bottoms up analysis. Uh, one, one, uh, one analysis that I saw which was done by one of our competitors actually was that they had taken every element of a battery and then they had done actually experience curves on every element of the battery and then added them up and said this is how fast battery costs could come down. But what they had completely missed was the interaction between those elements. So if you can make an, a cobalt anode half the size, you're not coming down the experience curve of the cobalt anode, you're coming down the overall experience curve of the technology. Another mistake that I have seen is people looking at and going out and looking in the market and saying, right now the most promising technologies are such and such and such and such, and if those technologies come through, it will reduce the cost this much. What that completely misses is the 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 engineers out there all trying to think of new innovations that they can bring to bear, and three analysts doing analysis can't possibly capture all of the potential innovations that could, could come through. The other thing that, uh, that the experience curve captures is things like economies of scale, where if you build a gigafactory and you're now making thousands and millions of cells, the fixed costs associated with that, the fixed cost portion of the cost bar comes down. The experience curve will not tell you what the next technological advancement is. In fact, it doesn't even have any hope of telling you what it is. It just tells you we know there will be some because the history of the world suggests that there are going to be innovations in competitive markets. And as I highlighted in the sort of scenarios, it might be a year or two different, but sooner or later that those innovations are going to take place and though we don't know what the innovation is, it will take place and those costs will come down. If you think about electric vehicles, there's really a couple of tipping points that you need to think about. Today, when people are buying electric vehicles, I own two Teslas, a Model S and a Model X. I'm really grateful to Sterling, and my wife's grateful to Sterling. She drives the Model X around all the time. I'm grateful that he led that program. But I didn't buy them because they were the cheapest cars on the market. I bought them because, first of all, I was talking to a lot of people about batteries and electric vehicles, and they were expressing their concerns to me, and I felt like I needed to own electric vehicles to be able to answer those questions. And so I was an early adopter on that. Some people buy them because they think they're green and so on, but they're not, it's not because it's economic. But then there's a point where you, the total cost of ownership, you reach total cost of ownership parity because the fuel costs with a battery are much lower than with gasoline. So if you drive a lot of miles, um, you will recover the, the premium that you paid for the vehicle. And that's a point where more people begin buying the vehicles. We've actually reached that point for people who drive a lot of miles. So an Uber driver who's putting on 50,000 miles a year is sort of at that, at that point. But the, the, the normal consumer isn't there yet. And besides, most normal consumers don't take full cost of ownership into account. Think about the last time uh, you bought a car. How did you think about doing it? Did you think, I'm going to go figure out what the insurance costs, what the resale value of the car will be. I'm going to take into account the fuel costs of the vehicle and the maintenance costs and so on. Did you do that sophisticated analysis or did you go in thinking, I can afford a $400 a month payment? You, pr you probably thought that. And so the second tipping point is where the mass market will really start to pick up on electric vehicles. And that's when you reach that purchase price parity, which as I discussed is going to be somewhere probably between 2020 and 2023. That's when you have people who are 
basically looking at it and saying, look, I can buy, buy this internal combustion engine vehicle for 26,000 or I can buy an electric vehicle for 26,000, but this is gonna be much less expensive to operate and I'm gonna have a full tank every morning because I charge it in my garage. I'm never I'm gonna have to stop at a gas station. This is gonna be a superior vehicle for me. And by the way, I'm not so, con I, I figured out that I don't care so much about range and so on. That's when this will start to turn up. Now, as you think about that and you're trying to predict what the penetration rate might look like, there's kind of three things. One, when will it happen? Is it gonna happen in 2020 or 2023? That changes the curve. How many people are actually gonna end up buying electric vehicles? What is it the right use case for? And then how fast will it, how fast will it go? And are there barriers that could slow it down? These are some of the signposts that we have identified that you should be watching for electric vehicles. And I'm not gonna take you all through them in, in uh, uh, in the sense of uh, you know, describing how everyone could affect it, but obviously things like the battery technology, the cost parity that we've talked about. Turns out that OEMs and car dealerships have a very strong disincentive to sell you electric vehicles. They, uh, they make a lot of their money on aftermarket parts and repairs, and uh, both the OEMs, the dealers, 80% of their profit is in that, uh, in that pools, and about 30% of the OEMs and so the OEMs, they like electric vehicles to the extent that it allows them to meet cafe standards and they don't want to sell one more than that. And the, and the dealers don't want to sell them at all because it costs them money every, every vehicle that they sell. And so they'll try and talk you out of it when you go there. That could be something that slows down the penetration quite a bit. They'll try and tell you range is an issue and so on. But we have now taken a look at those signposts and have just made some estimates of what the penetration curve might look like and we have various scenarios, but if you sort of consolidated those scenarios to a mid-case, we think it looks something like this, which says that by 2025, we might have 50% of all new car sales being electric. You remember that when I put up the analyst estimates before, the highest one was 35%, so that's significantly above analyst estimates. There are some things that could slow it down. I already mentioned the OEMs and dealers. It turns out that there might be a bottleneck of battery capacity that could slow this down um, because there's not only, as we get reach that tipping point, it's not only gonna be the auto industry that wants batteries, but the utility industry. At $100 per kilowatt hour, a battery is cheaper than building a gas peaker plant for a, a utility, and so suddenly you'll see utilities buying massive amounts of batteries, and so there could be a battery bottleneck. And it's also possible, as I mentioned, that the uh, battery cost reduction pace could slow down versus its historical um, experience curve or the technology doesn't come through as quickly. We believe it'll eventually get there, but it could push it out a few years. And so our slowest rate is reasonably slow. The, the green shading you see here is the range of third-party forecasts. And you can see that you know, in almost any scenario, the way we're looking at this, we have a more aggressive view on, on what battery uh, technology is going to do and what it will mean in terms of penetration of electric vehicles going forward. Now, if you think about this and you think about these three concepts, on the face of them, they're actually quite simple, but there is a little bit of a nuance here that we need to, need to capture. So in some industries, like with the electric vehicle, that battery cost is going to be the key driver, and you can do an experience curve on that. The unit of value, though, is sometimes difficult to find. So, for example, with tires, is the experience curve cost per tire or is it cost per tire mile? Turns out the right unit of value there is cost per tire mile, um, as, as it is probably with a whole car because it's a system of a lot of different things. But then also, take a smartphone. How do you, how do you calculate the value of what you're holding in your hand here which is actually quite different for every single one of us based on the various apps that we have. And so it's hard to calculate a, an experience curve on a, on a smartphone, if you will. You have to actually look at something else, which we call elements of value. If you could break it apart, there is an experience curve involved behind this. It's just hard to calculate. But you can, and I'm just gonna show you a tool to do that in just a second. Similarly, that whole 
elements of value thing comes into play when you think about substitution as well because different consumers actually value, oftentimes value things differently. For example, my wife is not really big on branded, uh, having a branded purse or handbag. She doesn't need the Gucci or Louis Vuitton or the, uh, the coach bag. She's more practical about that. But for some people, they put huge value on that brand and having people see them have that over their shoulder. Those are two different segments that value things like quality or service or brand very differently. And that actually also varies by industry, and so you have to take that into account. And then finally, this whole idea of substitution barriers, sometimes a product that has a very strong economic value proposition actually doesn't get taken up. And oftentimes that might be because of regulatory issues or it might be infrastructure issues, et cetera, and I'll give you an example of that. So now let me take, take you and just talk about this elements, well, elements of value thing. This is a look at auto prices over 30 years from the, the mid-1960s to the mid-1990s. Interesting thing is that the actual cost of buying a car went up. It was an upward sloping experience curve, if you will. Now, cars did get better. They became more reliable. They became more fuel efficient. And so the cost to drive a mile did come down a cost slope of about 85%. Remember that I said that the, you know, the, the normal human rate is about probably 75%, and so this is a little slower than that. But because that was coming down, in spite of this, consumers were willing to continue to buy cars, and penetration went up to a maximum of about 92% over that period, in spite of the fact that prices were going up. But what was going, there was another thing going on with cars, which is the car that you bought in 1966 was not the same as the car you bought in 1997. In 1997, you had more standard equipment, there was more air conditioning on cars, better radios, and so on and so forth. And even if you went to the bare bones car with the same equipment, it was better, it had more quality, it had better reliability. And so if you then disaggregated that and you looked at the adjusted purchase cost buying an apples to apples car that was dropping at an 81 percent slope but then if you looked at the cost of ownership now with vehicles what you're looking at is a more traditional experience curve okay so how do you capture that well this is a lot of work to kind of capture all of these elements but there are some things that you can do it actually turns out that if you think about consumers and how they think about value there's kind of 30 different things that have value to consumers. Some of them are around functional needs. Things like, does it save me time? Does it reduce my cost? Does it reduce my effort? Um, and so on. Think, and you see this in advertising. So for, you know, Geico's all about you're going to save money. Or if you look at another example, here's a, a hamburger helper ad that says it's going to save you time. The next level is emotional needs. How does it make me feel? You know, is it nostalgic? Is there design associated? Is it attractiveness? Here's an example of wellness. You know, it's a, a peanuts advertisement. It gives you uh, protein for your left hook and, and heart health for your left ventricle. Or fun. You know, here's a Nissan ad basically trying to sell fun with their vehicle. It could be life-changing needs. You know, things like, does it it creates self-actualization or motivation. Here's one uh, that's kind of the heirloom idea, the value of it. You never actually own a Patek Philippe. You merely look after it for the next generation. Or a Nike ad, find your greatness. Or the social impact things, the kind of self-transcendence. What's it do for the society? And uh, you know, here's an example of Lego trying to play to that element of value having a young girl building a, an astronaut suit and trying to build up you know, the value that, of the education that comes with their product. So advertisers are, are going after all of, these, uh, all of these elements or any of these elements and trying to prove that there's value to you in these products. And so what you've got to do is you kind of have to sort out how do consumers think about this and, uh, and what value do they see in it. One industry where we've seen lots of steep S curves and st steep decline curves is the music industry where we've gone from vinyl um, where 
going to vinyl versus uh, metal scrolls increased the, the quality of the, no of the noise sing signal and it was lower cost. Eight track tapes let you get and listen in the car. Cassette player allowed you to then record at home and, and have longer time. The Walkman lets you now go not only in your car or in your home, but walking around. The CD allowed you to skip tracks and have less noise. The MTP3 player allowed you to make your own playlist. And now we have streaming. And basically what happened is every step along the way, consumers were willing to pay more or less the same, but there was a new element of value that was created, and that element of value drove the, the substitution of one versus another. Similarly, this elements of, uh, of value analysis can highlight why one product wins versus another. You know the story of the Apple Newton, which ended up being a failure, versus the Palm Pilot, which really kind of changed the way we all did business. And the reason was that the Newton had a couple of elements of value, but the Palm Pilot had many more and so it ended up winning. This can be applied in terms of process as well. So you can think about e-commerce. And e-commerce has elements of value that have to do with price and cost. They have to do with the selection, the convenience, and the trust that you get. And understanding which elements of value are added to which products can tell you a lot about how penetration is going to happen in the e-commerce space. And in fact, you can do some market research, you can then rank these things, and what you have here is on those key elements, rankings by consumers of what they perceive the relative value by product category, and then the corresponding penetration curves for e-commerce. So this is actually a, a very nice tool. If you understand what the value is, you're basically taking at value and applying it the same way that you would apply the experience curve. One of the reasons Amazon has been so successful is that with their prime product, each year they've tried to add another product that adds another element of value to the point where today they cover many elements of value, which explains the very rapid penetration they've had from 7 to 85 million members in about five years. Now, another thing that I mentioned is this whole idea of infrastructure. If you think about washers versus refrigerators, they came out about the same time, but you can see that refrigerators had a much steeper penetration slope than did washing machines. Seems a little counterintuitive at first because a washing machine actually saves you more time than a refrigerator. So why would it be slower? Well, it turns out that there's an infrastructure issue here. And a refrigerator, has a, you just plug it into the wall, and most homes had a plug in the wall by the time refrigerators came out. But a washing machine requires that you have a drain and, and plumbing into the sewage system to be able to drain the water out of that washing machine. That is expensive to put in into a home. And so it created a very significant barrier to penetration because the full system cost is not just the cost of the washer, which saves you time and money, but it's the full cost of putting in the plumbing as well. And then finally, government policy. Government policy can make a huge difference here, and, and this is one where the U.S. had a really dumb policy and China had a really smart policy. Both China and the U.S. saw solar power as green, as clean, and as something that was desirable. And so in the U.S., what we chose to do was to give grants to solar companies. Those grants we gave to solar companies made them profitable even when they were making an expensive product. China's policy was quite different. What they said is, and of course they controlled the utilities in the country, but they said we are going to have 20% solar, solar, solar power by 2025, and so we are going to begin building solar utility-scale solar facilities throughout our country. And we are going to be buying a lot of panels, but we, will, we, we know that we're going to be spending more money than if we built utilities on coal plants. But our subsidy is on the project, but we're going to buy solar panels from the low-cost producer. Suddenly, solar panel providers knew that there was going to be a market for those, but all of their attention was focused on being the low-cost producer. And so after China made those announcements, the experience curve changed slope from an 84% slope 
to much more what we would expect, a 72% slope, they drove down prices and drove American producers out of business. So government policy can actually have a big impact on these things. So this idea of unit of value can be, a, be incorporated into the tipping points analysis, even in cases of complex value propositions. What you do is you identify the elements of value that are in the new product, do the customer research to understand the strength of those for that product, include the full systems costs like you got to put a drain in, and then look at the regulatory environment to understand what, uh, what barriers might be in there. So if I were to talk a little bit about applying that toolkit, I'll just give you one example. There's actually many that I could give you, but, but, I, but I like this example. It was an example with a utility that we were working with. And when we started working with them in 2010, they were basically, they had forecast that natural gas prices would follow the futures curve, which implied that natural gas prices would grow about 70% between 2010 and 2015. We had been watching the experience curve in natural gas, and we disagreed. We said we think it's going to go the other way. It's going to go down, not up. We were just one data point. The futures market was a data point, and their own research was another data point. So we agreed to disagree. None of us know exactly what's going to happen with natural gas prices. But then we asked the question, how would you know? What would be the signposts that would tell you? And things like how many wells are being drilled in, in, uh, in the Bakken and how many in the Barnett Shale and so on and so forth. And we put these, we put these signposts in place to say if, we, if you start seeing the, this many wells getting permits, because when a, when a company drills a well, they have to get a permit. Permits are recorded and you can track that data. That creates a signpost. Let's watch that signpost. If we see this, and we set some thresholds on it and said, if you see this many wells being drilled, the guess is that we're going to see an excess supply of gas and prices are going to come down. It's about I was four or five months after we did the work, those signposts flashed red. And at that point, the company immediately implemented some decisions that we had made in advance which is that they would shut down all of their old coal units and announce plans, or their subscale units, and announce plans to retire the rest. They bought a natural gas plant at a fraction of the cost of building a new plant. They restructured their gas supply contracts to, uh, to take advantage of what they knew and the market didn't. And they worked with their, uh, 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 with their local uh, public utility commission to reset the regulations so that they could, uh, they could set their PPAs with their suppliers to capture the market cost of natural gas as it was coming through. The outcome was, now they had a goal, very aggressive goal of being a top quartile producer, and their budget was to outperform the marketplace by two percentage points per year in TSR. They ended up outperforming by 6%, and they, uh, they more than doubled their market cap as a result and have been the largest TSR, um, or the best TSR performer since 2010 as a utility in the United States. So it's a powerful concept of being able to make that decision before the rest of the market makes the decision. What this approach does is allows you to do a number of things. You s it doesn't say that we know the entire future today. As I mentioned, there can be things that can slow down or speed up battery vehicle um, substitution. But what it does say is, what do we need to do now? If you're an automaker, what do you need to do now? One of the things you need to do is you need to get your balance sheet in, in shape so that when Sterling's products start coming out and the number of vehicles that are required in the market are not as great as they are today, you have the flexibility and resiliency to, uh, to deal with that. You also want to build out um, elements of optionality. You want to be able to, to basically have hedges built in so that you win either way. And you want to put these signposts in place so that you can monitor the environment and see three to five years in the future and just be able to see it a little bit before everybody else. Once you have those, those signposts, you can set decisions. When that thing flashes red, I don't have to do a six-month study. I know what I'm going to do. And you execute on that, which makes you actually much more agile. So that's really the story here. It's just a way of being able to see things before the market, the rest of the market sees it because there's a lot of money at stake in these technologies going forward. So thank you very much.